Good morning, Mr. Mackins. My name is Tony Marabella. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Let me see if I can find you on my computer. Okay, I got you. Uh, Mr. Mackins, I'm going to ask you a few questions today. Let, let's, let's start out, I guess, by, by talking about, uh, let's go back to the year 1998 when this occurred. Tell me what was going on in your life I know she was your ex-wife, the victim was your ex-wife, and I know y'all had a, a very rocky relationship. Would you tell me a little bit about what was going on in your life that day? Yes, sir. Well, we'd still been seeing each other, and I got off work. I've been working uh, nights, and I got off work and went by the bar where she was working. It was, it was early, and we hung out and drank some beer and shot poo and threw some darts. I hung out most of the day, and thing uh, the bar got busy and she got busy and later I asked her if she wanted to go out when she got off work and and she said she did and once she got off work we hung around a little bit longer at the bar and shot poo and drank beer and uh, just hung out and then we decided to leave there and go down to another place where we used to hang out and on the way down there we got into an argument and uh That's when uh, that's when I took took the life of my children's mother. I uh, I just things got out of control. I, I I am aware of of the facts of the case. I guess my 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 question is, what was going on in your life at that time? I know in your record you had been arrested at least two or three times, or at least charged two or three times with domestic abuse battery. They were all dropped, but there was a, obviously a very volatile situation there. What was going on with you in your life in terms of your anger, whether or not you were getting any treatment for your anger? Tell me what was happening with you back then. Yes, sir. I, I was not in a good place. I, I, I had a drinking problem. I was angry. I was selfish and I had been abusive in my relationship with my wife and my ex-wife. And several times that abuse had been physical and more times than not, it was verbal. But I uh, honestly, I don't think I think I had a problem. I, was, I wasn't seeking any help. Back then, when the various charges were dismissed, were there any conditions placed upon the dismissal? Did you have to go get counseling or did you have to go get an evaluation, either alcohol, drug, or mental health evaluation of any kind back then? No, sir. Now, let's talk a little bit about your alcoholism. Is it alcohol was the issue, alcohol and drugs? What was, what was the substance abuse issue with you back in 1998 and before it was alcohol i mean in in, in my early days as a teenager i had uh, experimented with marijuana i didn't like marijuana uh didn't like the drugs didn't like the pills my my choice was uh beer i drank i drank beer and, and I, when did you start about what age probably uh senior year of high school and how often would you drink? Uh, initially, probably three or four times a week. And then as an adult, uh, I might drink three or four beers in the evening. And uh, it, later on in life, you know, obviously my drinking became a problem. I don't think anybody really understands when they become an alcoholic. But I, at the time of the crime, I, I was drinking every day pretty heavy. Mr. Mackins, uh I'm going to ask you two questions. Were you an alcoholic back then? Yes, sir. Are you an alcoholic today? Yes, sir. Tell me what you've done while you've been in prison. Did you ever, tell me back that up a little bit. Did you ever take any treatment for alcohol, either substance abuse evaluation or any sort of treatment for alcohol prior to coming to prison? No, sir. Tell me what you've done while you've been in prison and what it's done to shape your attitude and your mind today about your alcoholism. 
Well, I, I've taken the Celebrate Recovery classes and I'm involved in AA. And AA has been the one that's been most significant to me. Uh, with my religious faith, I realized that when I began to deal with AA that I was doing a lot of the steps, but there was one step that I hadn't dealt with. And that was the first one. And that is admitting that I was powerless over alcohol and that my life was unmanageable until it wasn't actually until I started going to the AA meetings that I admitted that I was an alcoholic. When I look back on my life, it's, it's pretty evident, but you just don't see it when you're in it. And throughout your education of alcoholism and addiction, you've come to realize, as I understand, that that's a common belief amongst alcoholics, that they don't have a problem. Right. I mean, I don't think anybody, my, my father was an alcoholic and I understand the significance of the meetings because I saw him go to rehab at least three times and, and he never recovered. But the one thing that sticks in my mind is I never remember him going to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. And that is crucial. You cannot do this by yourself. It's impossible. Did you ever go to Al-Anon meetings when you were younger? No, sir. How old are you now, uh, Mr. Mackins? I'm 67. And you've been in prison 22, 23 years? Almost 23, 23 in August. Tell me what your plan is. Let's, let's assume for the sake of our discussion, you get out soon. Uh, what is your plan to make sure that as an alcoholic, you never go back to drinking? Well, I've already, uh, my daughter's already gotten some information for me from uh, the local AA meetings in West Monroe. And I've actually, I mean, in the event that I am released, I've actually already picked one out at Twin Cities. It meets at seven o'clock on Monday nights. So AA, and as you mentioned to me, AA is a, is a big part of your plan. Yes, sir. How long do you think you'll have to go to AA meetings? For the rest of my life, I, I actually enjoy the meetings. It's a, uh, it helps me, and I, I get a chance. Uh, people people help me, and I help them, and we, we you know we share we share what's going on in our lives. You know, Mr. Mackins, I I've heard that the twelve step program is really a good roadmap for leading a good life, and uh, it sounds like you've adopted that. Is that fair to say? Yes, sir. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about some of your other accomplishments. Uh, you've done some work through BRCC? Yes, sir. I've attended classes with the Baton Rouge Community College they had here at uh, the State Police Barracks. They came, instructor came and taught electrical level one and electrical level two. I've got certificates in both of those. And also I've had the opportunity with my job, although I'm a clerk, my uh, supervisor, Mr. Perry, has allowed me to get some hands-on experience with the electrical. And uh, I, I work sometimes with the maintenance crew. Uh, it's also my understanding that you got your BA and associate's degree uh, with NOBT, N -O -B -T -S. Tell me a yes. little bit about that. Yes, sir, that's a uh, Bachelor of Arts degree and associate's degree from the Bible College. I attended the Bible College for, actually it was five years, because it took an extra year, we were waiting on one class. And while attending the Bible college in my senior year, myself and another uh, student, we co-founded Grace Baptist Church. And uh, we, I pastored that church and still, before, until I came to Angola. But during the, the thing that's neat about the seminary is that when you're in the seminary, you're classified as an inmate minister. And, and we go around, we have uh, different areas in the prison assigned to us. And we go around and we minister to the men one-on-one. -on -one. And then when the volunteer group will come in, uh, it, it may be pastors from out of state or it may be legislators coming in. We would go and meet and we would have an opportunity to talk to them and, and share our experience in the Bible college and what, what the Lord was doing in Angola. And this, this is one thing I found that, the difference between Angola in the 60s and when I was there is that men quit praying on each other and started praying for each other. 
A lot of good work has happened at Angola over the last 40, 50 years. Uh, Mr. Mackins, uh, let's talk a little bit about where you are located now. You've been at the police barracks since, what, 2013? Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, when you first went to the police barracks, where were you working and what kind of work did you do? When I first arrived at the police barracks, I was a clerk at uh, Fleet Services down at headquarters where they service all of the state vehicles. I was a clerk in the out on the garage floor. Okay. And I understand that you're now with the Joint Emergency Services uh, program with uh, in Zachary, is that correct? Yes, sir. I work for Mr. Richard Perry. He is the facility director at, at Jazz Tech. Um, my job entails clerical work, repairing reports, getting ready for audits, taking care of the inventory. But like I said, I've, I've uh, taken the initiative to, to do some maintenance. I've learned to work on the, the ice machines and the electronic door locks, the satellite TV system, the chiller system, uh, just just a mire of things that I've had an opportunity. I've learned a lot since I've been here. And these are the skills that you've learned since you've been in prison. Right? Yes. Sir. Uh, you do have law enforcement opposition. Uh, the victims, uh, the family of the victim, uh, they are very uniquely situated. They are your family as well. Your daughter and your son both uh, are not only unopposed, they are uh, supportive of you getting this uh, uh, relief that you are asking for. Uh, Mr. Swear, could you tell us a little bit about, uh, what could you tell us about Mr. Uh, Mackins? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mirabel. As, as you stated, uh, Mr. Mackins arrived in 2013, been here about eight years, first two years at Fleet, uh, approximately five years now working at Jestec. Uh, all supervisors have done, uh, given him lots of praise, not only for being uh, competent, but for being willing. Uh, he's, uh, he's got an excellent uh, disciplinary report, only two write-ups that we have on record. Uh, neither of them here, so it's been at least uh, eight years since he's had any any problems. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of Captain Ed Middleton, uh, and I can tell you that uh, State Police Barracks, uh, uh, we're confident that he is an excellent candidate. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Chairman, that's all the questions I have at this point. Thank you, Mr. Marabella. I see Ms. Ms. Jackson has a question. Yes. Mr. Mackin, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. You have accomplished a lot during your term of incarceration. Uh, and everything you've done is, is really commendable. Uh, but the thing that I find most um, noteworthy is that you managed to not only maintain contact with your children, but repair the relationship that had to have been damaged as a result of the crime. How were you able to uh, have that relationship with your children, including your stepchild? What accounts for that? It's, it was, uh, I spent years on my knees praying for my children. Years and years crying out to God to restore our relationship and protect them. It's uh, one thing that uh, they say that 70% of the children of incarcerated parents will end up in prison. But by the grace of God, my children have not. And I love them and they love me. And uh, it's the grace of God. It's the goodness of God. That's the only place forgiveness comes from and reconciliation. 
and relationship. Well, I'm, I'm happy uh, for you, and I'm also happy for your children that you reach this place of restoration. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Um, Ms. Roden, would you introduce those who've indicated they'd like to speak? Yes, ma'am. Uh, first of all, we're going to hear from Gregory Mackins, a uh, victim in the case, but a uh, victim in, here in support. So, Mr. Greg, you can make your speech next. Now, three minutes, please. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is Gregory Mackins. I'm the youngest son of Greg Mackins. Uh, on behalf of the Mackins family, I'd like to thank the members of the board for the opportunity to speak on my father's behalf. I'm here with my older sister today, and we would like the board to know that we fully support the request for clemency and possibility of parole. In uh, 1998, we lost both of our parents, not just one. This proved to be very difficult uh, growing up. As you all know, my father served uh, 22 years of his life and also our life in prison. Throughout the years uh, that he's been incarcerated, I've seen the man that he's become and not the man that he was. Starting from uh, the visits at Angola and also the uh, police barracks. Throughout his time, he's been a, a model offender. He's obtained numerous degrees, certificates, and job training. And uh, the certificates don't mean anything without the actual hands-on training that he's getting down there. So it's a really good thing to prepare him in the event that, that he gets paroled. Uh, our family's lost loved ones and, and brought new life in ever since he's been away. He's missed uh, funerals, weddings, births. And uh, I asked the board today to grant him clemency in the hope of having my father back. I feel like. Uh, our family suffered enough and nothing we can do can change the past. We can, however, change what we do in the future. Dad, I love you. I forgive you. I'm ready for you to come on. Thank you, Mr. Mackins. Next, we'll hear from Roxy Mack Mackins, also victim in support. Three minutes. I need to read mine just to get through this. There is freedom to heal in forgiveness. My father has been with me on my healing journey. And because of that, I've gotten to witness him heal as well. When he could have chosen to bury his head in the sand, he met me in my pain and became the kind of dad who was present one who's concerned with the day-to-day -day wins and losses in your life, who roots for you to get the promotion and gives advice that I trust over anyone else. I'm not ashamed of who my father is now. He is wise and compassionate and filled with the knowledge of God. He bought me my first adult study Bible when I was in college. I still have the notes that he sent me from his classes in seminary. I can't tell you how many times he's prayed with me over the phone as I've cried about boys and jobs and disappointments and desires. When my husband lost his son last year, the first person I wanted to call was my dad. <laughs> when I lost my brother this year, dad was the first person I wanted to call. Watching him age in prison has been a source of heartache in my life that's only growing as he approaches 70. Based on his personal growth, in the last 22 years, I truly believe he's served enough time for his crime. It's my prayer that you would allow him the mercy and grace to go before the parole board because keeping him will not bring our mother back. But giving him a second chance will give us our father. Dad, I love you. Whatever happens today, I'm so proud of you. Thank you, Ms. Mackin. The next we'll hear in support from Mr. John Robson. Three minutes, sir.
Hello. I am so grateful to be able to express myself and the message that needs to be expressed about a man of stature. A man has to become <laughs> who he is. None of us are born ready and able to serve the master. And yet, each of us knows that there's a great pathway for us to cover. Some of the choices are good, some of them are terrible. But even then, most of them <clears throat> are useless <clears throat> without a continued awareness of the Word of God. Greg is a student of the Bible. He has given his life now to becoming that student. He's a disciple of Christ on a person-to-person -person relationship. He is a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has this wonderful degree that we have been blessed to offer at Angola for 25 years. I was the first director for some 20 years, and I have seen about 500 graduates with bachelors of arts and Christian ministries. <clears throat> you have let many out and they're doing so well. To my knowledge, we don't have anybody who's come back to prison or even needs to be back in prison. So many have good jobs and they're flourishing financially. Greg will, he, he is the top of his class. He got his degree in 2007, 2007, had excellent grades, became a tutor, became a teaching assistant. He, he never stopped reading theology books on his own. I had him as an assistant teacher for a number of years. He taught whenever a professor couldn't make it or there was another need that the class would meet when the professor wasn't there or extra classes. It, he was a grader. He did a great job correcting these men in their ways academically, but most of all, he was a leader of men. To be able to start a new church at Angola is remarkable because there were already so many and there was so much politics in the process among the inmates that there had to be the spirit of God in it. And he became a profound pastor. He is a pastor now. And he is a friend to so many men. I would think that of all the people that you have let out and you have bid them well, that he is at the top of the list. And I can say, without reservation that West Monroe will be the better for all of, of his return. And the prison system will be the better for him having been there and particularly so many inmates. I will just say to you, his overall character is impeccable. Professor, we need you to conclude, please. You're well over three minutes, please. Thank you. Well, you know, that's terrible to tell a Baptist preacher. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Is that Warden or not? Well, I'm not <laughs> saying any more, Cheryl. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Robson. Um, <clears throat> Is there a statement you'd like to make, Mr. Mackins, before we, uh, well, before we turn it over to Ms. Hogan? Yes, ma'am. I'm responsible for the death of my, my children's mother. 
I'm responsible for the death of someone's daughter and someone's sister. And there's no one to blame for what happened but me. And I'm ashamed of what I did. And I regret what I did. And I'm sorry. And I want to apologize. I want to apologize to my children and her family for all the pain and the suffering and the heartache that I've caused them all these years. I'm sorry. That's all. Thank you, sir. Ms. Hogan? Thank you, Ms. Renatza. I'll be very brief. Uh, Mr. Mackins's institutional record really speaks for itself. Within 22 years, he's accomplished a multitude of things, as you heard from Dr. Robson. He's only had two very low level disciplinary write ups in 22, almost 23 years of incarceration. Um, but I believe the most profound um, statements that we heard this morning were obviously from his children. And so we would, we would just ask the board to grant Mr. Mackin's um, immediate parole, uh, commutation of sentence with immediate parole eligibility. The parole project is here for um, his reentry. If he were to be granted release, we would support his reentry in any way. And um, based on the wishes of his children, as well as his exceptional institutional record, we would submit that clemency is appropriate in this case. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Marabella, this was your case. Are you prepared to vote? Yes, Madam Chairman, I am. Mr. Mackins, uh, based upon uh, your prison record, based upon the excellent comments by the warden, uh, based upon uh, what you have done and your plan for sobriety, uh, in fact, that, that you are a, tip, a terrific example of what one can accomplish in our prison system uh, through hard work and dedication and listening to your children in the way that you have been able to repair that relationship uh, is, is something that uh, I'll carry with me for a while. Uh, based upon all of those things, it would be my vote uh, to uh, commute your sentence to 99 years and make you immediately parole eligible. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Marabella. Mr. Wise. At this time, I'm going to be voting to grant uh, uh, commute your sentence to 99 years immediate parole eligible. You have good programs, positive comments from staff, and the victims was unopposed to this case. I'm just telling you, Mr. Mackins, uh, when this day comes, you do what you can with your family. Because they love you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wise. Mr. Roche? Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Mackins, under normal circumstances, I will tell you that <laughs> one would Short of 23 years is insufficient time served in second degree murder. In the circumstances in which that guru murder happened, I will tell you, you have served insufficient time. But I am the victim's advocate, and I have listened to you, daughter Roxy. And I've listened to your son, Greg. And they have implored me that you are deserving of a second chance and opportunity at living and becoming a productive member of society. 100% based on their statements. Or to vote to commute the sentence in 99 years with immediate parole eligibility. Thank you, Mr. Roche. Ms. Jackson. 
Shemak, and uh, I am delighted to be able to uh, vote for a commutation of the sentence to 99 years with immediate parole eligibility. All right, Mr. Mackins, and I do agree with my colleagues. Uh, my vote today also is to uh, that we recommend commutation of your sentence to 99 years with immediate parole eligibility. And that's based on the hard work that you've done. You've only had two low court write-ups in all of your time in, in prison. And I was quite moved by the uh, statements from your children. Uh, so we will make that recommendation on your behalf to Governor Edwards. We wish you well. Good luck, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Swear. Yes, ma'am. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Lots of, can we Thanks, everyone. At State Police, yes. Barrett, please. Yes, we'll close out. It's eleven thirteen. So let's unpack that. But before I do, I just want to let you know. So this hearing took place in 2021. And today, September 19th, 2023, they have his parole hearing. That means that Governor Edwards signed to commute the sentence. And then we're going to have the parole hearing. Thank you, Rich, for pointing that out and lining up the dots for me to make it easy to, to tie these two hearings together. I haven't yet seen the parole hearing. But what I thought I would do is first watch this, unpack it, and then with the parole hearing, tie it in. Oftentimes, it's just a pretty quick affair with not that much. Uh, I think we've only seen one, one parole hearing post-commutation that had been denied. Um, so we do have the court transcripts. And let's dive into this. So December 28th, 2001. All right, so let's look at the facts. But here's what he's doing on his appeal. He was sentenced to life in prison. He appealed saying that, that the sufficiency of evidence and the trial court failures to suppress four statements, which he made to police, um, were not allowed. So not a great start when that's your appeal to suppress four statements made to police. But okay, facts. During the early morning hours of August 18th, 1998, uh, Officer Doster of the Union Parish Sheriff's Office was dispatched to Farmville Hospital. At the hospital, the defendant, Gregory G., told officers Doster and Duane, Officer Leonard, that he stabbed himself. It's the old I stab myself excuse. Mackin suffered from multiple stab wounds and cut wrists. At this time, the officer did not advise Mackin of his Miranda rights. Mackins told the officers that his ex-wife was with him earlier. He also told the officers that he tried to... How do we say this without YouTube? Uh, he tried to do that. If you... You know, um, and that he then threw the knife into a wooded area because that's what people always do when they try to off themselves. The officer suspected that Mackin's wounds were not self inflicted. Good job, officer. Mackin's was then transferred to Conway Hospital in Monroe. Officer Richard from uh, from Ashita Parish Sheriff's Department was dispatched to Conway Hospital regarding Mackin's self-inflicted wounds. I know if there's any, if you needed any proof that I'm not from Louisiana, there it is. Officer Giddens advised the defendants of his Miranda rights and questioned him along with Sergeant Mark Masha. Mackin's told these officers that he stabbed himself while he was alone because, you know, why not? Sergeant Marsha stated that Mackin said that although his ex-wife was not with him at the time he stabbed himself, they had been in a fight earlier in the evening. Mackins gave the officers his ex-wife's address, description of where he stabbed himself, and where he disposed of the knife. 
Um, the Oshita police likewise suspected that Mackin's wounds were not self-inflicted. The officers left Conway Hospital to find Mackin's ex-wife, the knife, and a possible crime scene. The police found Donna Mackin's, Donna's body in the sand pit off Highway 34. Mackins was then arrested on August 20th, 1998. How did he think he would get away with it? It's just totally nuts. Oh, yeah, the police are just going to say, sure, you know. Uh, let's see Let's see the, the excuse he gives, though, at trial. Like, he went to trial, so you got to be delusional. At trial, the defendant testified that he plans to he that he pl that he had plans to go out with Donna on the evening of August 17, 1998, after she got off of work. He testified that he arrived at her place of employment contrary to Mary's uh, contrary Mary's bar about noon. Mackin stated that he and Donna drank and played pool all afternoon. He further testified that Donna was upset because she wanted him to drop pending charges against her. Because she wanted him to drop pending charges against her. What are they referring to here? Let's see. They reference it here. Mackins claims that there were pending charges against Donna and Union Parish. Mackin stated that Donna found him and another woman in his trailer. He further testified that Donna allegedly broke a window in his trailer and the windshield out of the woman's vehicle. Defendant claims that Donna scratched him, slapped him, and tore off his shirt during the incident. Got it. Okay. So he was claiming that she was upset with him, I see. Um, where were we? Mackins claims that they left the bar and drove down Highway 34 to talk. The two argued in the car as he drove. Then Mackins pulled out, pulled over at the side of the road and sand pit area to talk. He stated that Donna got out of the car and went around to the driver's side. He claimed to have exited the car with a knife and showed it to Donna to scare her. Because, hey, you know, you should be very scared, Donna. Yes. She should be. Why did I lose? I just moved this so you could see it better. And go. Mackins asserted that Donna told him to put the knife up and then. Uh, and that he gave it to her. At this point, Mackins maintained that Donna stabbed him twice and that one stabbed him was to his lung. Mackins stated that the two struggled while he attempted to get the knife away from her. Mackins remembered stabbing Donna twice. Then uh, Ernest Roy testified at trial that he was contrary, that he was at Contrary Mary's Bar. Oh, that's the name of it, Contrary Mary's Bar. It's a strange name. On August 17, 1998, and saw a big man following Donna. Uh, he could not identify the big man as the defendant. Further testified that Donna left the bar. He heard screaming and saw the big man roughing her up, cutting her, shaking her, and beating her. Why did he not do something? Are you kidding me? You see a man beating up and cutting your coworker, and you don't? Or just a person, I don't know if they're a co-worker, then you don't call the police? <laughs> God, I mean, he said Donna and the man spoke for about five minutes and she kept shaking her head no. Eddie Joy Donovan testified at the defendant's trial that she relieved Donna as a bartender at approximately 4 p.m. Donovan testified that a person who she understood to be Donna's ex arrived about five to ten minutes after her arrival, however, he could not identify Mackin at trial. As the person she saw at the bar, Donovan further testified that the man she saw had a very angry look on his face. The man told Donna to shut up and that he was tired of being stood up. Donovan also stated 
that Donna was nervous and upset and that the man followed her out of the bar. Remember, this is this is testimony at the trials, right? So Donna Henderson testified that she was driving by Contrary Mary's Bar between 5 and 5.30 p.m. on August 17, 1998. Henderson saw a blonde-headed woman being forced into a car by a big man. She could not see the people's faces. She testified the vehicle was gray-colored, a little two-door, possibly Mazda, and Mackin's testimony stated that he was driving a gray Mazda on the date. Oh, good for her for picking it out. In addition to Mackin's two statements given August 18th, two other statements were revealed at trial. Officer Leonard testified that he and Lieutenant J. Vey spoke to Mackin August 20th um, at Conway Hospital. Officer Leonard testified via advised Mackin's of his Miranda rights before Mackin's gave a statement. He also testified Mackin's understood his rights and agreed to speak. After taking Mackin's statements, the officer arrested the defendant. Okay, Dr. Stevens Hain, Dr. Hain, stipulated forensic pathologist expert performed Donna's autopsy. The autopsy revealed that Donna died from a total of five stab wounds and one slash wound. One, two, three, four, five, and a slash wound. There was a total of nine stab wounds, which included penetrating wounds to the chest, three stab wounds to the left lung, one to the heart, and another to the right lung. The slash found uh, across the front surface of Donna's neck. He slashed her neck as if everything else wasn't enough. He wanted her gone. This was violent. Dr. Haynes stated that he found defensive posturing injuries on Donna's right and left upper extremities. He further testified that it appeared that Donna was beaten first, then stabbed several times. First, she was beaten. In addition, Dr. Haynes testified that it was unlikely that Donna ever had control of the knife, and it was unlikely the knife was taken from her, as Mackins claimed, due to lack of bruising on Donna's palms. Mackins waived trial by jury and after Ben trial was found guilty. Then they go into those details, which we can, you know, when you hear about that, when you hear that a man, and he was no child, that a full grown man brutally beats his wife, then stabs her in the heart in both lungs, but to then make sure he finishes the job, he, he, he slits her throat. And then he stabs himself and pretends he, whatever. And you hear about that kind of violence. It does make you just say like, I, you know, how do you know that he, But it, 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 I guess it does come down, you know, there's the, they believe that he is safe, they, that, that he's not dangerous anymore. They believe that it was a crime of passion. But again, it's, it's, you know, there's one thing to pull a weapon out and pull the trigger. There's another to person to beat and to stab and to stab and to stab and then to make sure you finish the job by slitting. And it's the mother of your children. And they were divorced already at the time. This isn't, it just makes you, but it, it, what it comes down to the commutation recommendation is the, how well he's done in prison and the idea that his kids want him out. And I mean, Mr. O'Shea stated very clearly, I thought it was great to see that perspective of that side of Mr. O'Shea, he said he would have denied he's the victim's advocate. But in this case, the victims very much want their father back. And I guess the question is, after serving just 23 years, if there, there's no one in opposition and the children 
say they want their father back, that's enough to get it and to have done incredibly well in prison. You're, he is, he's not a young man now. And you're making the assumption that he's just not a danger to society. Man, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty tough. I'll tell you that. I'm happy I'm not a board member. I, I did like when the preacher started talking, it was like a classic preacher thing. I was like, oh, come on, you know, not again. But he won me over when Mr. Mr. Natsa told him to stop and he cracked that joke and then just stopped. I thought I want to bring that up. That was pretty good. But let's go see what the parole hearing uh, is about and I'll tie it in and we'll finish it from there. But I think he's going to get paroled. Good morning. Committee on Pearls called to order today is Tuesday, September 19th, 11 06 a.m. My name is Brendan Kelsey. Along with me, Ms. Pearl Wise and Mr. Tony Marabella will be panel, staff, and support seat of DOC headquarters in Baton Rouge. Our remote location is a state police barracks. Would staff and support there please introduce yourself? Lieutenant Jeremy Burns, executive officer. Lisa Frazier on classification. All right, we're ready for our first case. And we'll, uh, we'll also be out Mr. Kerry Myers, Mr. Gregory Mackins, and Rox Roxy Mackins that'll speak at the appropriate. All right, please introduce yourself, state your name, and DOC number for the record. Gregory Mackins, 433102. All right, Mr. Mackins, you heard the introductions. We'll have a parole interview, ask you some questions. You can respond at the end. You can make a statement. We'll take a vote. Do you understand the process? Yes, sir. Gregory Mack is DOC number 433102, your first class offender. Pro eligibility date 5-17-2023, good time 10 20 full term 8-26-2097. Uh, you have a uh, 99-year sentence. You had a commutation signed by Governor Edwards on 3-17-2023. Is that sound correct? And this is for yes, second degree murder. Does that sound correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Would you please answer Mr. Marabella's questions? Good morning, Mr. Mackins. How are you? My name is Tony Marabella. I'll start our interview process. Uh, how old are you, Mr. Mackins? 69. How long have you been in prison on these charges? Since 1998, 25 years. Tell me a little bit about your educational background. How far did you go in school? Got a high school education, and uh, when I was at Angola for 12 years, I graduated from the Bible College, NOBTS. Uh, in my senior year, I founded Grace Baptist Church, pastored that church until leaving in 2013. And also during that time, I was the uh, personal clerk for senior chaplain Jim Rents, uh, Brad DeLauder, and chaplain Robert Tony. I have uh, since been here at the barracks. Electrical level one and two NCCER certification from Baton Rouge uh, Community College. Now you're currently uh, your your assignment now is where are you at the governor's mansion or where where are you at now? Yes, sir. I'm general maintenance at the governor's mansion. How long have you been at the governor's mansion? Since February. Okay. And prior to that, you were at barracks in Zachary. Yes, sir. I worked for uh, the facility director here, Mr. Perry for seven and a half years as a clerk slash maintenance. And prior to that, I was two years at uh, fleet services in the garage as a clerk. Tell me a little bit about um, what was going on with you in August of 1998. Let's talk a little bit about what happened. So tell me who you were back then. I was an alcoholic. I was. Uh, in a pretty dark place, angry, bitter, frustrated. How did how did this crime occur? Tell me what led up to it and what did you do? Tell me, tell me what happened. Yes, sir. Well, me and I, I can preface it a little bit. Me and my wife had been divorced, and then we had lived together, and then we didn't live together, and then we lived together again. And at the present time, we weren't living together, but we were still seeing each other. So I'd gotten off work early that I'd worked the night shift and gotten off and she worked at a little uh, 
neighborhood bar. She was working days, so I stopped by there to talk to her. And uh, we were probably there an hour, hour and a half before anybody ever came in. We started drinking, shooting pool, and uh, listening to the jukebox. Things got busy, and uh, we talked about going out when she got off work. And I hung around until she got off, and we continued drinking. I did the rest of the day until I'm thinking maybe five or six o'clock when we left and we left and intentions were to go to another little neighborhood bar where we had hung out before we ever got married. And, and we got into argument about some things in the past and the sayings in the present. And uh, that's about it. That's when I took the life of my, my children's mother. Now you have two children with her? Yes, sir. And who are your children? Gregory and Robson. And they're supportive. They're here today to, to speak on your behalf. Yes, sir. Relationship with them. You maintained a relationship with them? Yes, sir. It's, you know, uh, what I did tore our family apart. By the grace of God and a lot of prayer, family has come back together. My children, since I've been incarcerated, have supported me and forgiven me, and not only forgiven me, but they have loved me and embraced me this whole time. They've always come to see me. Mr. Mackins, you, you've talked uh, a little bit about your faith-based programs and what you've done uh, in the faith-based community. Talk to me a little bit about what, if anything, you've done about substance abuse, about your alcoholism. Tell me, tell me what you've worked on in that regard and how you would maintain, how you hope to maintain your sobriety when you get out. I've been attending AA classes for, for a while. I've got uh That's my 25 year sobriety that I just got in August. I've already uh, got an AA sponsor, which I spoke to last night in Monroe, if, if, if I'm granted parole. His name is David M. And uh, the little house that my children have for me, little two bedroom house, it's like 10 minutes from uh, Pine Street, 1900 Pine Street, which is, I was talking to Mr. David last night and I asked him if he was familiar with 1900 Pine Street where the AA meeting is. And he said he just happens to be driving up there right now. So he was going to a meeting when I was talking to him last night. But there's one thing, this is what I think, as far as AA or any other program, you, you, you know, you do a 30 day program or a 12 week program until you take what you've learned from that program, you have to you have to embrace it as a lifestyle. It's not a program that you're going to complete. It has to be a lifestyle for the rest of your life. So what I, what I'm hearing you from you is that you'll probably go to AA meetings for the rest of your life. Yes, sir. Lieutenant, what can you tell us about uh, Mr. Mackins that? Uh, well, I, I just realized today when I was looking through his file that he's been here for 10 years. It doesn't seem like that long. Um, he's been great. Uh, absolutely no problem. Very quiet. Uh, always looking forward to helping somebody. Uh, he does, aside from him working at the governor's mansion, he's also taking care of our TV and our cable program. He, he's very talented. Uh, in electrical work, and he's he, he doesn't ever stop. Uh, when, when I'm 69 years old, I hope I can work half as much as he does. Uh, so we we he, he's he's going to be tough for us to lose, but we're we're ready for we're ready to lose. Uh, Mr. Mr. Mackins, uh, your children, as I said, the children, uh, the victim in this case, as well as your children. Uh, support your uh, your move. Uh, Mr. Kerry Myers is is here speaking on your behalf as well. Uh, you are a low risk. And you do have law enforcement opposition. You get that a lot. There's nothing you can do about it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's all the questions I have. Hi, Kerry. Would like to make a statement? 
Uh, yes, yes, good morning. Uh, Carrie Myers, Louisiana Parole Project. Did, uh, I think Mr. Mackins uh, expressed himself uh, very well about how he's addressed uh, the issue that brought him to prison. Uh, I want to tell you that he's uh, since his um, pardon hearing, his clemency hearing, he's he's not taking it uh, uh, for granted. He's continued to work. He continues in AA. He's now a certified 100 hours tutor. Uh, he's a celebrate recovery uh, facilitator. Uh, he continues to work. He can. Uh, he's uh, as Lieutenant Byrne said. Uh, he self-taught himself satellite TV and electronics uh, and maintains the systems there at the barracks. Uh, his parole project is uh, here to support him through his transition. Uh, he has a, an extremely strong long-term plan. And without taking up any more time for the board, just ask this board to grant this parole today. Right, thank you. All right, we'll hear from uh, Mr. Gregory or Roxy. Y'all can both go up here together or one at a time, whatever y'all want to do. Can I say? Yes. Okay. Yeah, look at that. Well, I'll introduce myself. I'm uh, Greg's youngest son. It's a pretty uncomfortable conversation. Oh. I was hoping I would come up here and kind of get upset and get kind of flustered. I got a lot of people watching, you know, back home and my dad there. But we've been in support the whole time. Um, we talked a little bit outside of the lobby there that I hope this is the last conversation I have to have with strangers about this. Sorry. Uh, it's kind of an emotional thing to talk about sure. with, with our family. I think that I mean, you can hear everybody's opinion of him, what he's done, the better himself. Uh, I didn't really want to write anything and, and, and kind of have this formal statement. You know, I submitted a statement to the, uh, what is that, the Board of Parole? And, uh, you know, I want to thank y'all for giving us a chance to come here and talk today. And I should start with that. But, other, other than I've forgiven him, and some people would look at that and not agree with it, but that's their decision. I'm going to take up too many people. You know, the time I hear my lost son more. I, I'm in full support of my dad being. He's done everything he could do while in prison, incarcerated, better himself. Uh, he's been there for me and my sister. As much as he could, right? As mm -hmm. much as he could. So, surely you guys see a lot of people come across here that aren't in this situation, that don't have the support, have done things that he's done, doesn't have the plan when he gets out. So, I'd really like y'all to take that into consideration. That, that we're here to support. Uh, he's going to have a good support system when he gets out as far as state residency, uh, you know, job, and support from my sister and I. I had some, some bullet points up here to talk about, but I mean, really, that's what it is. You know, and this is this uncomfortable situation to talk about, like I said, in a room full of strangers. I hope this last time I have. I'm here my family's part. We're, we're in full support. Thank you guys for the time. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you thank, thank you for coming. Thank you. I too have a little trouble emotionally navigating this conversation. But the most honest statement that I could make. Oh, uh, is that when I count my blessings, I count my dad. Since, since I was a little girl, he made the process of reconciliation gentle because he was 
understanding and acknowledge the pain that he caused us. And his, his remorse has allowed me to forgive him. And you can always choose to forgive and forget it, but to forgive and remember is tough. It has been for us. And we have seen him um, in his guilt and his shame and regret and his sadness. And I'm just really proud of him. I'm proud of who my dad is. Uh, I trust his counsel. When things happen in my life, he's the first person that I want to call. And, uh, you know, it would just be nice to sit down for dinner or watch a football game together. And, uh, you know, a cup of coffee, those are just things that we don't really get to do together. So uh, I'm sorry <laughs> for crying all over the place. And thank you guys for listening. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank you, you so much for your comments. Thank you all for being here. Um, <clears throat> all right. Mr. Mackins, would you like to make a statement on your behalf? Yes, sir. I would like to. Uh... state what we already know. I, I took the life of my uh, children's mother, and I'm very sorry for it and, and the pain and the suffering that I've caused them all these years, and especially uh, the days leading up to this hearing and today. I knew it was going to be difficult for them, and uh, it's uh, breaking my heart. I'm sorry for the pain and the suffering and the heartache that I've caused other members of Donna's family, that was her name. Her name, their mother's name is Donna. And I'm also thankful to the family members that helped uh, raise my children all these years. There's no way I can, I can ever repay them. But they were family members that helped. My children could have my son could have been in prison and my daughter could have been a drug addict. But by the grace of God and a lot of prayer and a lot of help from family, they're fine, young, upstanding men and women. I'd also like to apologize to the people of Louisiana for the financial burden that uh, my incarceration is, is brought upon the state. And I want to thank y'all for taking the time to consider giving me a second chance. And if that's what you choose, I promise I'll give you my word. I will not let you die. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I don't fair to vote, Mr. Marabella. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mackins, uh, your record uh, speaks for itself. Uh, you have been, uh, as is, is rarely mentioned, a model prisoner. Uh, you've been in trusted positions uh, for the last 10 plus years. Uh, you have uh, taken some excellent courses. You've given back to the community, uh, prison community. Uh, you have maintained a relationship with two wonderful children who are here today to show the courage and love that they have for both you and their mother. I can't imagine how difficult it must be for them to be here today. Uh, but, but they're here with love, and they're here with today. Uh, but, but they're here with love, and they're here with support for you. And that speaks a lot for you as well, to have been able to, to maintain that relationship uh, over these years. Uh, you have uh, a low risk. Uh, you're in a trusted position. You have an excellent transition plan. Uh, your children are here to support you. Uh, you are aware of your alcoholism, and you have a, a great plan for sobriety. Uh, my vote today would be to grant your parole uh, with the following conditions, is that you attend three AA meetings per week uh, and uh, continue to follow. Good luck to you. Ms. Wise. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Gregory, uh, it is a beautiful story of redemption. We don't get to see this very often, and I am just 
honored that I had a chance to see it today. I'm just honored. Uh, I do want to mention for the record that you got a letter of recommendation from the staff member at the governor's mansion. We don't see that very often. Uh, alluded to all the positive things that's already been said. Uh, so my vote is to grant, and I concur with the special conditions set forward by Mr. Mayor Bellum. Best wishes to you, sir. Right, Chip. <clears throat> Two votes to grant your parole. <clears throat> also, I'm going to vote to grant your parole today. Again, we want to thank you guys. This is just not the norm for us to see. I know this has been difficult on y'all. We appreciate it. Uh, but just for the work you've done, you're being granted today for the things that you've done, that you, you've achieved this opportunity uh, and uh, done a great job. So I vote to grant uh, with the same special conditions. You have NAA three times a week, but I want you to do community service six hours a month. You give back to the community, speak to people, tell your story, you have an opportunity there. So you have the community service six hours a month, NAA three times a week. Uh, your pro's been granted. Yes, sir. Uh, I failed to mention that uh, my son-in-law, his family owns the boys home in Monroe. His dad established it years ago. And with my DLC certification, the little house I'm living in is right across the street from the boys home. And I plan to do some social mentoring over there at least a couple of times a week. Well, there you go. You can get your hours right there. Sounds great. We appreciate it. Well, three votes to grant your pros been granted. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's all the Johnny Robinson house? Well, there you have it. I kind of disagree with with uh, Mr. Brennan Kelsey. I don't know if it's about things he did, but maybe about the forgiveness that his children are giving him. Like Mr. O'Shea kind of stated, he wouldn't have made the recommendation to the governor. Interesting, you know, what Ms. Wise said, this is a story of redemption for me it all comes down to the children of course if the children were did not want him out he he wouldn't have, he wouldn't be getting out uh with really relatively you know speaking not that much time served what 25 years 26 years But that's it. He uh, this this took place today, 2023. Well, it's only going to be today for, but it just took place a few years after his his commutation hearing. The governor signed it. They paroled him. Like I said, I expected it to happen. I for a second when his son got up and said, "I've been supporting him this whole time," and he seemed emotional. I thought, "Oh no, are we have is this going a different direction somehow?" But It, it is definitely a, a, a unique story and simply from the perspective of the children, I mean, what are you going to punish the children more and keep them locked up? But yeah, you have a story to tell. What's the story? Don't stab your ex-wife, um, the mother of your children to death. Go preach it. But maybe the story is that even when things are as dark as uh, are just more dark than you can imagine, there is always a second a second chance. I mean, if anyone should get it, I, I agree it would be him because of his kids again and and he worked really hard. He plugged away. He earned his way into the governor's mansion. And uh, now he's earned his freedom. He's figured out how to get his freedom. And uh, hey, Christmas is around the corner. It's going to be a special one for them. But with that, I'll let you go. Now, excuse me, February of 1978, he was sentenced to death for a first-degree murder conviction.
In May of 1979, you were resentenced to life without the benefit of parole, uh, parole, excuse me, parole, probation, or suspension of sentence for a period of 40 years. Uh, you were resentenced in accordance with a plea agreement. Is that correct, Mr. Collins? Yes, ma'am. All right. Would you answer Mr. Marabella's questions, please? Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Collins. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Collins, how old are you, sir? 71. And how long have you been in prison on these charges? About 47 years. And this occurred in 1976. Uh, you were approximately 24 years old at the time, is that right? Yes, sir. Let's talk about Johnny Collins at 24 years old. Uh, how much education had you had back then? 24. How far did you go in school? About eight grade. Did you ever get your GED or have you gotten your GED? No, sir. Were you working at the time? Yes, sir. We were doing a little poke wood. What kind yeah, of work were you doing? Oh, Were you back then? Did you drink alcohol? No, sir. Do any kind of drugs? No, sir. Well, tell me what happened in 1976 uh, when you kidnapped and murdered young Veronica Hardy. Tell me, tell me in your own words what happened, why you did it, and what you did. Yes, sir. We were all at a store out there in the country, and we started having worries in the store, talking back and forth, calling one another different names and things. And we were all walking down that road. We left the store and went walking down the road. And I turned around, she was walking behind me. I turned around and grabbed her around the neck and choked her and strangled her out and drug her out in the wood and left her. Tell me why you did that. What 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 prompted you to do something like that? How old was this little girl? 13 years old? About 13, 14, something like that. What what prompted you to do this? <clears throat> Not thinking. Not doing no thinking, sir. Now you weren't on drugs, you weren't drinking alcohol. No, sir. The was not bothering anybody. So why why would you do something? I wasn't doing no thinking. It's running. Well, you've been in jail for 47 years. What kind yes, of sir. thoughts have you given to what you did? Tell me how you feel now about what you did. I don't feel good about it, sir, because I know I did a bad thing and it was a bad crime, sir. Well, uh, as, you, as you've been in jail for 47 years, tell me what, if anything, you've been able to understand why you did this. Yes, sir. What, what have you, what, what, what have you, what conclusion have you come to? I wasn't living the right, sir. I was doing little Nick Mike things and doing other things, sir. And that's what it led to me to do these things. Well, I, I look at your record. You had you 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 had a number of burglary convictions. You never did very well uh, on on supervision. You always revoked. Uh, you had just gotten off of. Uh, probation or parole about three months before this happened. So why so much crime? Why were you committing so much crime back then? I wasn't, I wasn't living right, so I wasn't doing the right thing I supposed to do. I wasn't listening to people. People was telling me good things for me. I wasn't listening. Well, I mean, I, I guess I might be able to understand why you burglarized the house because you, you maybe wanted some money and maybe you wanted to get something out there. But, but why would you attack 
and kill this little 13-year-old girl. Let's talk a little bit about what you've done while you've been in, in prison. What kind of programs have you taken that helped you at all? Uh, what what can can you remember any of the programs that you've taken? I went to the uh, a sex program school way back. In 2002 and 2003, you went through the sex offender training program. Uh, yes, it took three phases of that. Tell me what you learned in that program. If anything. I learned that it, it's a good class for me to take because of the crime that I had committed. And it helped me in, a, in the right stage of mind and everything. It helped me to think before I do things. In the, Help me accomplish stuff, you know, and to control my, my 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 mind and my thinking ability. So you attempted to rape this little girl while she was in the woods, is that right? No, sir. I wasn't intending to do that. Well, you grabbed her. Uh, you you you. Uh, is it your position today that you really was not interested in? Any sort of a sexual thing with her? No, sir. You took the sex offender. What did you learn in sex offender treatment that might have helped you? I learned that it'll help you control your mind and your thinking ability to stop you from committing crime and, and, and realize something before it happened. Control your mind. And thank you. What What did you learn in sex offender treatment that might have helped you not commit this particular crime? Help you to think and not to uh, do the, the bad thing no more, and uh, help you to think before you commit these kind of crime and realize to keep your mind from getting to that type of stage again. You know, and realize something before it lets you get too uh, frustrated to commit a crime like that and to think before you do it. How you said you, you quit school in the eighth grade. Why did you quit school in the eighth grade? I realized I couldn't learn too much, sir. Have you tried to take some classes while you've been in prison? Maybe some literacy classes, some things that will help you read and, and write? But he'll have a literacy class. I asked him about that, but he said he don't have that type of class. Okay, now you've been in prison for 47 years. Uh, th there has been no programs that you could take while you've been in there that you know of? No, sir. Can you read today? No, sir, not that good. Can you write a little bit? No, sir. When you took the programs that you took, uh, you took 100 hours of pre-release. Uh, were you able to understand the things that they were telling you in that, those programs? Yes, sir. When the school teacher reader, he explained them to us. So you have assistance when you take these programs? Yes, sir. Have you given any thought to the family of this little girl and what they've gone through? Uh, all this time? Yes, sir. Tell me a little bit about that. Yes, sir. 
I know I did a bad thing, and I know I brought a lot of the hurt to them too. And I would feel remorse for that. And I, were you angry? Did you have anger issues? No, sir. I wasn't bad. I wasn't angry. Have you taken anger management courses? No, sir. You you haven't? I thought you took it. Uh, okay. You were uh, a tear walker, is that right? Yes, sir. Tell me what that is. As watching over somebody to keep them from doing hurting themselves. What is the RC club? That's a club where they serve food. Okay. Where they cook and serve food for the camp, sell food. Where would you go? Uh, I, I see Mr. Myers is here. Uh, where would you live uh, if you were released at some point in the future? I would like to go to the uh, parole project place until I live and get I go out and give yeah. me my. Where would you go after you go through the parole project? I would go to my sister. And where does your sister live? In Bowie Parish. Tell me about your health. What would uh, do you have any sort of medical issues? No, sir. You take any kind of medication? No, sir. What, what can you tell us about uh, Mr. Collins? Sir? He's, he's asking me, John. Huh? You know, since since Johnny's been here with us in this environment, he's worked his way up to uh, Class A trustee status, and that's been since 2006. He's had write-ups. Uh, he had his last write-up in 2016. Um, he's he's worked as a yard orderly. And like I said, in in this environment right here, um, he's 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 been doing okay. Are there any literacy programs there that he might be able to take? Yes, sir. Is he um, just, is he just to, trying to get into them or what? Well, according to the, the summary that I've had here, and I, I don't know if you guys have or not, but uh, he took a uh, E-level TAG back in 2016. Uh, his scores across the board were in the low to mid 300s, uh, but did not enroll in any educational program following uh, his exam and there was no other educational history that we have on file. Thank you, Warden. I appreciate your comments. Thank you. I don't see any other questions, so we'll go. Can we hear from the Parole Project, Mr. Myers? Uh, yes, good afternoon. Kerry Myers of the Louisiana Parole Project. To tell you that um, should Mr. Collins be successful today with his petition, Parole Project is prepared to offer him support um, transitional support in particular, make sure he's connected to his medical and other services and uh, that he's uh, entitled to. Uh, we will assign him a case manager uh, that'll help him navigate uh, after 47 years, obviously. Uh, he's gonna uh, need assistance in navigating that. Uh, we're committed to, to however long it takes to help uh, Mr. Collins uh, move forward. Uh, if that's a few months or multiple months before uh, he goes to his sister or in the, in the alternative, helping find long-term uh, independent living. Thank you, appreciate it. We'd like to hear from the opposition and first we'll hear from the victim's uh, brother, I guess, uh, Dale Hardy, Mr. Hardy. Uh, yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Yes, ma'am. My, my, my name's Dale Hardy. 
Veronica's brother. Um, me and um, uh, I, I and I appreciate the board here, hearing me today. But um, I wanted to say how much uh, in opposition I am to his release. Um, this horrible crime um, that I feel he's somewhat making light of happened when I was 11 years old. I was, me and my sister were a little over a year apart in age. I was fixing B12. She was 13. And this this happened at our home. And this this still today is is my home. And um, uh, for my, my kids are, are grown now. But for the age of my kids, I couldn't let them out in the yard by themselves. I couldn't let them walk out to the streets by themselves. And and this is the house where today I live, where I can walk out to the street and see where she was abducted from, see where she was drug off the road from. And um, my children live on the same property with me, and I have five grandchildren. And the thought of him coming back to Bossier Parish uh, at, at any age, in, in my opinion, is just just totally unacceptable. I mean, this was a this was a horrible, horrible crime on a 13 year old child, and and, and I would uh, I would strongly and and uh, be gratefully if the board would reject reject this this uh, plea. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And um. This is Mr. Nick. Yes, ma'am. Okay, sir. All right. Thank you very much for hearing me. I also agree with what my brother said. Uh, this was a horrible crime, but I do want to make note that uh, my dad was a heavy drinker, and he uh, he had kind of stopped drinking because he had some health issues with that. But when this happened, it it just took him out. He started drinking, and he died of cirrhosis of the liver. Thank you. Totally opposed. Yes, sir. Thank you. And um, we have Mr. Gerald. Yes, you want to speak, sir? If you step up to the podium. Yes, yeah. My name's Gerald Hardy. I'm uh, a little sister, bro. Um, the day this happened, I was in town working. Mother called out there. Me and Debbie was looking for it. Anyway, uh, I just would wish the Lord would uphold his sentence life for that bro, so it means he doesn't need to be back on the street. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. P. No. I'm Major Donna King from the Public Sheriff's Office. I'm representing Sheriff Jim Woods. And today, he had me somewhere else. This day, I was a young deputy that day. I've been on the about two years. I'm the last deputy alive that wrote this case. I was with him, General. He found his sister. Terror and the fear that Mr. Collins put him in the Bellevue community is still alive today. I don't know if they ever him. If he comes back to both parish, I'll share that alone. We don't want to do that. And they'd be best since he got off the death row and got to have his life he did just then. Yes, sir. Thank you. And uh, from the DA's office, sir. Thank you. for having us here today. My name is Skylar Morgan, DA in Boca Bay Parish. I was 15 years old when this happened. And uh, I live actually in Western Parish, and I remember my father, who had been a DA, and now that's the history of it. Never, he didn't know when it was done home, on the that day, I 
My father said, or if you be who's not traveling, we we'll carry this gun up the game. <clears throat> That's what it did in this community. Um, I don't get the impression that he's done a whole lot better himself. I know it's he's aged considerably, but it's not for him. He's got an education, so on a long time ago, he never didn't appear to make any effort to do anything like that. Um, I think that's just what emphasizes age now. Uh, and you to give him some relief. Um, this we all hear a lot about truth and sentencing. I know the DA try to preach it to everybody in the legislature. Listen, this is exactly what the truth and sentencing is about. This family was told life perfect with the electric chair. They got commuted, they understood that. But then don't worry, it's life, it's mandatory life. <clears throat> and now you got to come back and tell them, oh, the former DA, hopefully they lied to me if they were wrong. You know, it's just not right. They didn't get his life sentence. He appeared to be functioning. Uh, and they go from the rescue to deny him. Mr. Marvin, uh, good morning. Good morning. Do you have in your notes? The exact sentence that was given when he was a resentence to life? It was life uh, imprisonment without the benefit of probation parole, was suspended sentence for 40 years. For 40 years. So basically, after serving 27 years, he's eligible for parole and we speak. I would think. Under that sentence, I, I never have seen a sentence like that before. I thought, you know, all the death penalty people that got their sentences overturned in the Robinson case right. became uh, automatic life without benefit case. Yeah. This is the first one I've seen. I, I can't explain why that was the sentence that the court thought was appropriate or exactly recommended from the Supreme Court down to the back of the district. Court. But that was the sentence because that's what I have in my record. That's if I appreciate it. And according to that sentence, he should be um, eligible for parole as we speak. I will concede that. Thank you, sir. Ms. Shipley. Yes. Can you speak to that for us? Yes. Um, actually, at that time, they would, the judges would hand down those sentences. Some would be uh, life uh, with parole after 20 years or life with parole after 40 years. But the statute for first and second degree murder requires life without parole. So that overrides the judge. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you for that clarification. I appreciate it. Yes. Um, Mr. Collins, is uh, is there anything you'd like to say to the board before we vote? No, ma'am. Okay. I think we're okay. Um, Mr. Marabella? Mr. Collins, uh, you know, you're 71 years old. Uh, you've served 47 years in prison. Uh, you, you don't have much education, and it's uh, looks like you have difficulty communicating. And I appreciate that. I understand that. Now, maybe I didn't ask the appropriate questions in the appropriate way. Uh, I'm I'm just very concerned about your acknowledging what you did and what you did to this young 13-year-old girl. Murdered her, tried to rape her. You've taken a few good programs. Uh, you're a trustee. You've done some good things while you've been in prison. Uh, and you're 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 functioning well while you've been in prison. Uh, my, I, I really, even at your age, I really have some concerns about voting to let you out. 
based upon the opposition, the nature of this crime, uh, opposition from law enforcement, uh, victim opposition, uh, my vote today is to deny your uh, request. Now, Mr. Freeman. Uh, first off, I want to thank everybody that showed up today. Uh, appreciate it. You know, it's hard on you. Uh, I I have to agree. You you didn't acknowledge what you did. I mean, and it's it's quite evident what you did. So uh, my vote is to deny. I mean, first family was told death sentence, and I understand that that changed, but no, my vote is to deny. Thank you, Mrs. Jackson. Uh, Ms. Collins, you you've done well while incarcerated, but I don't think you done very much to prepare yourself for life on the outside. After 47 years of incarceration, the world is, is nothing like the one you left behind. And I just don't think that you're equipped uh, with the tools that you need to survive uh, in the world today. Uh, although you say that you're going to live with your sister, of what kind of situation she's in, what her health is, and it's conceivable that you could end up in the world and have no one. And I just don't think that you've done enough to prepare yourself. And so my vote is to deny. Thank you. Mr. Roshan. Mr. Collins, <clears throat> based on express opposition, from the entire legal community, especially the DA's office, and the victim opposition, no signs of rehabilitation in an extensive criminal background, my vote is to deny your request. Mr. Collins, I don't think you're ready. Um, you know, I, there's no evidence that we can see of any any work that you've done to prepare yourself for today, for today's hearing, let alone life on the outside. Um, based on the opposition that's been expressed here today, uh, my vote today is to deny your application. So today, sir, your application for clemency has been denied. Good luck to you. <clears throat> okay, so how do we unpack this? There, there are a few things. We'll go into the court transcript, but we'll also dive into some of the, the peculi peculi peculiarities. Oh my gosh! Um, of this, uh, uh, how they brought up in in the the ruling. Um, you know, I, I was actually. I was going through the court documents that Richard provided, thank you, of this case while I was watching it. And and there were a lot of abnormalities that I picked up on. So I was, I was actually glad that they reviewed that during this hearing, like the idea that he had gotten the death penalty, that it was retracted, and then he had gotten the, uh, the judge gave him uh, life, but but with the opportunity for parole after 40 years. And remember, this is a commutation hearing, not a parole hearing. So they had to figure out, wait a minute, if that's the sentence, which he did receive, he should be having a parole hearing now, not a commutation hearing to get recommended to the governor. But then they said, well, what's going on? And it was in the legislation legislation that the judge actually didn't seem to understand the law and gave the wrong sentence, uh, which is, I guess that can happen. Uh, and that the that the actual law overrode the judge's sentence. Now, maybe some attorney could try to appeal that somewhere. I, I don't know. But uh, that that's what they were talking about today. Now, It is nice to see a hearing where you have the police officer who is there at the time show up, that you have the D 
DA show up, that you have all of these people show up for this little girl. At the time, just a little girl. August 11th, 1976. And then we'll go into the, after we go through these details, we'll go into the, the, the details about this case. It, it, I, I find it to be quite interesting about how it was overturned and what happened. Um, and then there are some questions you might want to bring up. For example, his IQ is very low. They talk about it here and they talk about it. Was it against his constitutional, um, was his constitutional rights violated that they interrogated him and his IQ was so low that, that maybe that wasn't okay. They, they're, they say his IQ was um, at the mildly impaired or delayed level, but initially they said it was even at the mental retardation level. Um, so there's a lot of, and that can bring some light into maybe the style of his interview and what they were even expecting from him. Um, it's just something to take into account as well. Sharing all the facts that I have here. On August 11th, 1976, a 13-year-old girl was abducted, sexually assaulted, and then strangled. 13. When she did not return home from an errand to the grocery store as expected, the police were called and soon learned that she and the defendant had departed the store about the same time. The officers found the defendant at a neighbor's house and noticed that she was not dressed in pink and noticed that he was not dressed in pink pants and flowered shirt as reported by the person at the store earlier that day. When asked if he had worn different clothing earlier in the day, the defendant replied that he had changed from some green color clothing. The officers immediately advised the defendant of his constitutional rights. With the owner's consent, the officers searched the neighbor's house and discovered a pair of pink pants and a flowered shirt with two buttons missing. So the eyewitnesses said that she had left with the man wearing these clothes. He said he was, but he changed, and then they found the clothes. The remaining buttons on the shirt matched two others, which had been discovered at the location where the girl was believed to have been seized. So this little girl may have pulled the buttons off his shirt, and in that way, they were able to catch him when she was fighting back for her life. The officers again advised the defendant of his constitutional rights and placed him under arrest. The defendant subsequently confessed to having killed the girl and led police to her body in the woods several miles from the grocery store. The defendant's mental, now this is what they're saying, the defendant's mental incapacity to, per, to proceed was raised by the defense and after the appointment of a sanity commission and a hearing of the district court committed him to a state mental institution, finding that he lacked the requisite mental capacity. So they did say, even then in 1970s Louisiana, that he was that he lacked the, the mental capacity to go to court. Isn't that interesting? But approximately eleven. So then, so then, the, the, you know, they say no. He he's he's not fit. He's not. He's too. He's not there. And, and then it was eleven months later. They had a second sanity hearing, and a motion to suppress hearing. The district court determined that the defendant had achieved the mental capacity to proceed and his, inculp and his inculpatory statements and confession were admissible. So at first they said, hey, he, he can't go to trial. He's he's not fit. And then they, 11 months later, said, no, 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 he, he is fit. The defense contentions of mental incapacity to proceed are based on essentially upon the evidence induced at the first sanity hearing. The medical consensus of the first commission was Collins is moderately or mentally retarded, trainable, but not ed educable. I guess that means like he can't be taught to read and he still cannot read, has an IQ of 43. Now, according to Google, 43 is, I mean, 69 is extremely low. 
40 to 54 would be moderately impaired or delayed. Oh, they have different they have different tests, but it's mentally retarded is my understanding. Um, clinically. Right, I'm not saying that word in, in an offensive way. Is it offensive to say that word? I don't know. Um, I, I'm saying it from the clinical sense. I'm reading it. Okay, so I'm reading it here. You see, if doctors found Collins to be mildly of an IQ of 68, um, where are we? 43 would be unable to understand. So, so if he had the IQ 43, he would be unable to understand the proceedings or assist in his own defense. However, after 11 months of medication and therapy, the second sanity commission reported the markedly different findings. Now, whether it was actually different findings or it was pressured by the state or who, like who really knows, in my opinion, you know, I, I, frankly, I'm surprised they were able to actually for 11 months say he wasn't. It just feels like that wouldn't really happen in Louisiana. But hey, we learn something new every day. And we are reading between the lines and we don't have all the details. But um, the earlier findings were discounted by the Second Sanity Commission as not being accurate. So the second sanity commission is like, no, the first one, that just wasn't legit. Um, and due to having uh, been made shortly after the crime in a more hostile environment, when he was upset, he was less motivated before he'd been given medication for his anxiety. And I don't know how anxiety medication will affect your, uh, will affect your IQ score, but there you go. Um, during the second sanity hearing, the court did not rely solely upon the conclusion of the mental capacity experts, both the district attorney and the judge examined the witnesses closely with respect to consideration pertaining to the nature of the charge, the complexity of the case, and the gravity of the decision which the defendant was faced as required by, and they give the reference. The decision as to a defendant's competency to stand trial should not turn solely upon whether he suffers from mental disease or defect, but um, but must be made with spe specific reference to the nature of the charge, the complexity of the case, the gravity of the decisions in which he faced. So it it it, it is quite interesting, I think, um, to go through this legal exercise for those that are interested. I'll put the link. In, in the description. For instance, there was testimony for, for the two psychiatrists and a psychological assistant indicating that Colin was fully aware of the nature of the proceedings, the nature of the charge against him and its seriousness, and the nature of the defense available to him. The doctor's testimony contained specific details indicating that Collins understood his legal rights, was able to recall and relate facts pertaining to his actions, whereabouts on the day of the crime, and maintained a consistent account which uh, tended to um, exculpate him from the offense. Collins reported to the doctors that he had been in the store on the day of question, that he had seen other persons pick up the girl after she left the grocery store, that he had confessed to the crime only after, only out of the fear of being lynched, and that he was able to lead the police to her body only because of something he overheard from another person near the investigation site because of his knowledge of the woods. So what they're saying here is, hey, I mean, he's he was capable. He understood the situation. He actually had it had an, a well articulated excuse for why he confessed and how he knew where her body was. And that's a rather good point. Uh, according to the sanity hearings evidence, Collins was able to identify witnesses who could cooperate some of the details of his defense and report the information to his attorney. The doctors further testified that Collins would 
could be able to make the decision necessary to assist in his defense, testify on his own defense, and that if properly medicated, his mental condition would not apt to deteriorate the stress of the trial. One psychiatrist who had cared for the defendant at the forensic unit testified that since medication was given for anxiety and not for psychosis, he believed that even the defendant's medication uh, was stopped. Even if it was stopped, he would still have the mental capacity. It's interesting to reference anxiety medication. Um, you know, it's like you're thinking something else. Like he was on medic, he was on psychotic medication for eleven months, and that. But no, they're just saying it was anxiety medication. Um. Here at the top, we fast forward back to the top. This is what they were talking about with the death penalty. So what, what was interesting is they um, the question of law presented by his appeal is whether Louisiana's 1976 capital punishment legislation authorizes the imposition of a death penalty for a crime committed before the effective date of the legislation. For the reasons here and after assigned, we conclude that the death penalty may not be applied retroactively and that capital sentence in this instant case must be set aside. So in the appeal, they said, you know what, he shouldn't get the death penalty. And that's because what was, you know, I, I didn't realize this, but, and one might not, you know, think this, but the death penalty was abolished and then reinstated. In, in Louisiana. And because of that, um, they retroactively applied that sentence, but they said, wait, you couldn't. You couldn't do that because at the time you committed this crime, the the death penalty was not was not uh, legal in Louisiana. It, it's quite an interesting situation here. Chat GPT tells me that the death penalty has a long history in the state of Louisiana. It has been used at various points of the state's history and its legality and application has evolved over time. The death penalty was reinstated in Louisiana in 1976 after the United States Supreme Court decision in Gregory v. Georgia upheld revised death penalty laws in several states, including Louisiana. This decision effectively ended the nationwide a moratorium on the death penalty that has been uh, in place since 1972 Supreme Court decision in Furman versus Georgia. So then here's where it says, consequently at the time of the offense in this instant case, life imprisonment and hard labor without the benefit of parole probation or suspension of sentence for 40 years was the only constitutional punishment for first degree. And 21 days later, October 1st, 1976, statutes redefining the crime for first degree of enacting permissive and presumably constitutional death penalty. So what's interesting is that this document itself says 40 years life without the benefit of parole, probation, or suspension of sentence for 40 years, which is what the judge has sentenced him. And then what they said no was not in the, stat the statute. But I'm confused because they wouldn't get this wrong. But you know what I mean? Like, there's one thing for the judge to give an improper sentence. There's another for it to be listed legally in the counter of an appeal. So someone who is much smarter than me, or just a little smarter than me, I'm not that smart, can please uh, add some light on this. I'm, I'm just curious. I wonder if he somehow doesn't, is eligible for parole, and there's just some type of oversight. I think that's
that's quite interesting. For those of you who are still watching, I salute you. <laughs> but you know, it, it it was the one thing that really struck me or struck home to the core is when the 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 brother of the sister talks about how he still lives there with his kids and grandkids all on the same property, and that that is that that is that is so I don't know. To step outside every day and see the corner, like to see where he, it's just, that's intense. Another thing about this one hearing is, why did you kidnap and kill her the little girl? Um, Mr. Mirabella asked her and asked him and he was just silent. He was silent for maybe 10 seconds. It felt like an eternity. The silence, it was like deafening. For those of you who listen uh, with their phone on unlock screen and not watch, as do I for, for most things I do on YouTube, um, you, you might have checked your phone to see if you lost connection. But he was, he just steered. And I actually appreciated that silence because what can you say? How can you answer that question? Why did you, you know, do that to a 13 year old girl? You, silence is the, you know, I get that that's not, but at the same time, I actually thought it was powerful, whether it was intentional or not. There's nothing you can say why you did that. But he he was married and he had two children of his own. And he was working and supporting his family. It's listed there in the court documents. So whatever you want to say, you know, he he seemed quite still quite capable to do all of that. And yet he went out and destroyed a little life. Um, and, and frankly, yes, yeah, someone who does that should not get out of prison. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, he's stuck in Angola. That's been his life. He has no family. And he claims he has a sister, but she's not here. No friends in those chairs. And he has just our friend, Carrie Myers, who would actually get up and make some statement on his behalf. We know what you're about, Carrie. But With that, I'll let you go.